My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International and European Affairs in Dublin. I'm delighted to welcome those of you who are here in person and also those who are here online. And I'm pointing over here because I was recently told I always pointed up here to welcome those who are joining online, but that's actually a light. So pointing at those at home, it's lovely to have you here. And for those who braved the um, braved the weather today for posterity, because of course all of our events are recorded, um, this is a snow day in Dublin. So when we woke up with the giddy promise of a snow day and schools and creches around the country are closing, uh, geopolitics never closes. So the Institute remains open for business and just a real sincere thanks to those, especially our speaker, obviously Nigel Inkster, but those of you who could come in as well, it's much appreciated. So we're delighted to be joined today by Nigel Inkster, who is formerly Director of Operations and Intelligence at MI6 and Senior Advisor for Cybersecurity in China at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, a truly eminent think tank in the think tank world. Nigel will provide an address on the topic of re-risking geopolitics. So Nigel is going to speak for about 20 minutes or so. Um, and then, of course, we'll go to Q&A in the traditional format. So those who are here in attendance with us, you can raise your hand and a mic will come to you. And those of you who are online can use the Q&A function. And just a reminder that the discussion today is on the record and you can participate in the discussion using the handle at IIEA as ever. So I'll now formally and briefly introduce Nigel Inkster before handing over to him. Nigel Linkster is Senior Advisor at the International Institute for Strategic Studies and a Director of Geopolitical and Intelligence Analysis at Enodo Economics. Previously, Nigel served as Director of Operations and Intelligence for MI6 and served on the board of MI6 for seven years. In 2017, Inkster was appointed to the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace, participating in the drafting of its eight norms related to non-aggression in cyberspace. The author of The Great Decoupling, China, America, and the Struggle for Technological Supremacy in China's Cyber Power, Nigel's lifelong fascination with China started when he studied language and culture, the language and culture at Oxford. I'm also delighted to say on the way up, Nigel told me he's currently listening to Ulysses, which we all know it's one of the great ways to access Joyce is to listen to him. So this is also a visceral experience for Nigel because he's in the middle of Joyce in Dublin, obviously, while making this address. So Nigel, great to have you here. I invite you to the podium. No. Well, well, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to come here. I, I hadn't had much engagement, any engagement actually with this institution, but I know it by reputation and it's... Uh, yeah, really nice to be here, and uh, you know what a lovely building you ha you you have. Um, very interesting to reflect on the speed and scale with which uh, geopolitics has come back to the fore. Um, you know, if if, if I suggested maybe even five years ago that that this was an appropriate topic for discussion, I think you know people would have been looking around nervously, wondering who had the number to summon the men in white coats. Um, and certainly, I think for people in the private sector, you know, international corporations, um, the return of geopolitics has come as a major and unwelcome shock, all of a sudden the realization that actually you can't any longer expect to do business around the world uh, as if you were in New York uh, or Chicago has has uh, taken a while to uh, to assimilate. And my sense is that many private sector corporations are still uh, struggling uh, to, to come to terms with it. But the fact is, geopolitics is back after what, in effect, has been a 30-year holiday that we um, more or less enjoyed since the uh, end of the Cold War. Um, but if one looks, you know, a kind of, you know, uh, across um, the wider uh, course of human history. Um, it's actually the 30 years that we've just been through that is the anomaly, uh, not the situation we're in now. For most of recorded history, uh, you know, major uh, uh, power confrontation has been the norm. Um, and it's just taking us a little while to get back to you know, uh, an understanding uh, of this. You know, I grew up in the Cold War. Um, it you know, defined pretty much everything we did. 
Um, and you know that 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 was the, the the normal one. Simply accepted it and adapted to it, and we did so in the event quite successfully, absent a few near misses with on the nuclear side. Um, and you know, I think you know this this is clearly where we're going to get back to. Well, what has driven it? Um, well, you know, there, there are a number of um, uh, factors, but I think you know the the, the, you know, the 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 big one is the unipolar moment is over. And uh, many parts of the world are now chafing under a US-led international order, which they no longer perceive to be fit for their purpose. And nowhere is this more true than in relation to China, a country that uh, whose modern history has effectively been driven by you know the whole concept of the century of humiliation, the fall from grace, uh, from being one of the most um, prosperous, well-governed, and powerful states on the planet, to a kind of indigent outlier pilloried as the sick man of Asia, and everything that China has been doing for the last hundred and fifty years is about getting back to where they think they were. Um, and you know, to a significant degree, were at the kind of apogee of the Qing dynasty around the 18th century, when um, Enlightenment thinkers like Voltaire and Leibniz, you know, were you know sort of very enamoured of uh, the way China uh, ran things. Um, and this has gone through various phases. You know, the, the establishment of the the People's Republic, um, the you know the, the the chaos of the Mao years, the Cultural Revolution. Then finally coming blinking into the daylight and deciding that the thing they had to do was to develop their economy. And pretty much from, I think, 1978 to 2008, what that's 30 years, if my math is not uh, um, out, um, we, we had a China that appeared very much to be a status quo power that effectively did not have a foreign policy beyond doing the minimum necessary to uh, ensure the conditions for economic development. Quite happy to free ride uh, on US supplied uh, security goods and re really not a challenge. Um, well, you know, what has changed? Um, essentially, I think there always were cracks um, you know, in, in the relationship between China and the United States, pretty much from the start. Um, uh, and but you know it has progressively become more difficult you know to paper them over. I think two thousand and eight was a critical turning point. Um, the uh, Beijing Olympics, um, the uh, international, the global financial crisis. I think at that point, China, which had uh, experienced turbocharged growth following its entry to the World Trade Organization. Um, was feeling more powerful, um, more skeptical about the benefits of the US-led system, the Washington Consensus, um, and increasingly feeling that it was time for China to assert itself um, and kind of set the terms of the debate going forward. This began to happen under Hu Jintao, but it really you know, um, uh, achieved takeoff under his successor, Xi Jinping, who um, was appointed Secretary General of the Communist Party, the only one of his titles that actually really matters, um, in 2012. And at that point, we had you know, the China dream, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, this you know, concept of uh, China effectively returning to the global status it enjoyed, you know, during the uh, high years of the Qing dynasty, um, and a kind of method for getting from here to there, um, in 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 terms of you know the very vague formulation of a community of common destiny for mankind, you know. Now, when this first you know, term first you know were, were began to to surface. I don't think most Western politicians paid it any attention. Why would you? There was no substance, so it was so vague as to be, you know, uh, virtually meaningless. That was a mistake. Uh, this is important because what China is doing in the community of common destiny is actually proposing an alternative system of governance to the U.S.-led global order, um, and you know this is couched 
in language that seems benign, inclusive, moralistic. But actually, when you drill down and look at what it really is, it is um, self-interested, um, hierarchical, illiberal, and coercive. Um, it is a, a design that is, you know, aimed. You know, China knows that we're not going to be persuaded by you know the, this formulation, but it is aimed at the global south primarily, and we're seeing a lot of buy-in from countries in the global south that didn't even exist as countries when the U.S.-led order was uh, set up, and no longer feel that it particularly benefits them. So this is where 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 China is going, and. You know, we, we we now find ourselves in a situation where relations between China and the U.S. have become very tense. Towards, I, I think, in the latter part of 2023, there was widespread international concern that the relationship between the U.S. and China would spiral out of control and into conflict. And there was a period in the latter half of 2023 when I think Xi Jinping was effectively blanking the United States in the belief that any attempted engagement would only result in outcomes detrimental to China's interests. That has since changed to the extent that the two sides are now talking. Both have looked into the abyss, you know, don't like what they see down there, um, and are making some efforts to at least manage the relationship and try to put a bottom under it. But the simple truth is that what divides these two great powers are issues of ideology, values, and geopolitical interests that are diametrical, diametrically opposed and very, very difficult to resolve. Um, and you know, we're, we're looking really at three areas here. You know, what in an Odo economics we come to call the three T's of trade, technology, and Taiwan. Um, trade, well, we saw, you know, basically when China entered the WTO in 2001 on developing country terms, which was the only way it possibly could with it when its GDP was that low, um, the good times were rolling. Everybody was making lots of money in China. Nobody stopped to really uh, think and take action about China's signal failure to live up to its commitments under the WTO to open up its markets, and in particular, its capital market. Uh, and that was a, you know, a major contributing factor to the 2008 uh, financial crisis, a, a buildup of unsustainably large uh, savings glut. Uh, that that you know nobody could you know uh, ever cope with. I remember talking to Mervyn King, former governor of the Bank of England, about this. Who said, you know, we better hope China doesn't open its capital account up because if it did, we wouldn't know what to do with the money. And he's absolutely right; we wouldn't. Um, so you know, there was a, a big problem there. We had the you know Trump, Donald Trump, initiating a trade war um, in twenty eighteen. You know, you know, Trump, I find, you know, sort of intriguing figure. You know, he's solipsistic, narcissistic, an ignoramus, and a vulgarian. But he's not stupid. And I think his instincts on China, although, you know, it was really a case of, you know, Trump arriving at the right answer for the wrong reason. You know, he, you know he's a mercantilist. He sees uh, international trade in zero-sum terms. And you know he persuaded himself that you know the U.S. was being ripped off by China, and actually, in many respects, he was not wrong. How he went about dealing with it is another matter. But I think you know it probably was a moment to actually uh, put a mark in the sand and say you know this cannot be allowed to continue the, the, the way that it's going. And um, and actually now I think it's clear that China is looking to develop an alternative uh, global trading system that is very much based on interaction with the global south you know, again that you know that that has become you know the, the focus of, of china's activities in these areas then there is technology um we saw china um moving rapidly um to industrialize and to embrace the benefits of information communications technologies whilst recognizing 
their subversive potential. And the thing that surprised everybody was, you know, Bill Clinton said, you know, managing the internet is like trying to nail jello to the wall. Well, the Chinese have managed to nail a lot of jello to the wall and have really actually, you know, um, managed to tame the internet to the point where they can't stop people from saying things they don't like, but they can damn well know who's saying them when, and they can come after them as and when it suits their purposes. China has established itself as a major player in the manufacture of information uh, communication technology equipment. Um, in major US corporations like Apple, NVIDIA, Qualcomm um, derive a huge percentage of their annual revenue from um, trade with China and from you know, manufacture in China, you know, saving on costs. I think Qualcomm uh, uh, derives about something between 40 and 50% of its total revenue from China. It's really quite amazing. Um, and um, you know, China has you know, made itself a kind of global center of what might, one might term trailing edge semiconductors, you know, 28 nanometers um, upwards. Um, the US is now trying to you know, rain on China's parade, preventing it from going further up the value chain, starting with Donald Trump with the five gen fifth generation mobile technology. Uh, we saw in 2018 that you know, uh, Chinese national champion Huawei was uh, um, making a bid to become the kind of global supplier of choice on 5G technology much of which was derived from US intellectual property, but uh, um, it turned out that you know, no US company could actually manufacture an end-to-end -end, uh, 5G system. You know, the manufacturing had been so much outsourced that the US you know, could no longer put it together. Well, I mean, you know, sort of fairly crude uh, coercive techniques were applied by the US to prevent allies and partners from moving uh, to, 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 to Huawei. And under Biden, we've seen an intensification of that policy um, under the so-called Sullivan Doctrine, Jake Sullivan's speech in 2022 to Eric Schmidt's uh, Special Competitive Studies Project, um, you know, where he said, you know, up until now, we've been content to just stay a couple of generations ahead in, in these technologies, but some of them are now so critical to national security interests that we have to establish as large a lead as possible. And this has been followed up by a fairly swinging embargo on the sale of advanced semiconductors and the equipment for making them to China. And this is hurting, but at the same time, it's also paradoxically incentivizing um, China to you know, um, double down on indigenous innovation. Most Chinese corporations in this uh, game uh, up until now wanted to have American technology because it was better, you know, more advanced, more reliable. Now they find themselves you know, um, at risk of being deprived of it. Their only alternative is to turn to um, Chinese uh, suppliers. And we're now beginning to see, you know, the, the, the sort of positive interaction between, you know, design, implementation, feedback, which is, you know, critical for, you know, moving up the value chain. So I think most of us in the, um, you, know, you know, who occupy that sort of interesting niche between China and technology, take the view that the U.S. is not going to be able to, you know, keep China down long term. The best they can hope to do is to kind of buy a decent interval to get themselves in in a better position than than you know, they currently are in terms of diminishing reliance on 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 Chinese uh, manufacturing. And then the third T is Taiwan. Um, an irredentist uh, issue for China. Xi Jinping has said that the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation cannot take place until national reunification has been achieved. Problem with that is that over the years, Taiwan has not been moving closer to China. It's been moving further away. And poll after poll indicates that more and more Taiwanese identify as Taiwanese and not Chinese, as was true of their parents, many of whom came with Chiang Kai-shek at the end of the uh, Chinese uh, Civil War. Um, Taiwan occupies a particular strategic situation as part of the first island chain, which China sees as something that boxes it in, 
and which the United States sees as critical to maintaining its domination of the Western Pacific. And Taiwan is also the, you know, through the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, uh, the producer of about 50% of the world's semiconductors and about 90% of the world's most advanced semiconductors. We're talking here, you know, 9753, soon to be two uh, nanometers. Pretty soon we're going to hit uh, the subatomic level and then that's going to get very interesting. Um, so Taiwan, you know, is important. Um, the Taiwanese talk about the Silicon Shield, you know, TSMC. I, I've never been particularly persuaded uh, by, by, by that argument, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's one that has had currency. Um, and you know, the worry is um, if uh, China cannot achieve reunification by peaceful means, that it might feel it has no alternative but to uh, pursue reunification through non-peaceful means. You know, in an older economics, we monitor this on a monthly basis using traditional classic you know, intelligence analysis uh, methodology. And at the moment, we reckon that the, you know, the likelihood, you know, three to six months of um, uh, um, you know, um, the use of military force is pretty low, about 15%. Um, but that could change very uh, easily and quickly under certain circumstances particularly because since uh, um, 2019, 2020, the United States under Trump, but also under Biden, has uh, um, put pressure on uh, China over Taiwan by increasing engagement, increasing um, uh, defense sales, and generally just getting much more involved um, in, in dealings with Taiwan. Um, the U.S. Uh, 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 position on um, intervening in the Taiwan Straits in the event of, a, uh, of conflict has been one of um, strategic ambiguity, neither saying they would uh, nor they wouldn't. But Joseph Biden in the last two years has at least four times, you know, to my recollection, said that uh, the U.S. would intervene, even though on every occasion his officials have walked it back. Um, I think you know when, when when somebody said something four times, you kind of you know have to suspect that they might actually mean it. Um, and you know the, 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 this probably is the flashpoint that that could most easily ignite uh, between these two major powers um, with consequences. I, I was tempted to say unpredictable, but they're not unpredictable. Actually, they're all too horribly predictable. Uh, and are likely to result in you know, uh, major discontinuities and interruptions of global supply chains that uh, some estimates um, have put at uh, $10 trillion, just kind of for starters. And as we all know, um, when it comes to armed conflict, it is very rarely, if ever, over by Christmas. Once conflicts start, they tend to take on a life of their own, their own dynamic. And, you know, the trend is to greater prolongation. And it's very interesting to see that the Chinese People's Liberation Army are now starting to look, you know, having looked at Ukraine, think very seriously about the implications of a potentially prolonged uh, conflict over Taiwan, rather than the sort of Putin-esque, you know, uh, coup de main that, you know, decapitates uh, the regime and then it's all done. So, you know, we have this situation which kind of, you know, in a sense, you know, I, I always say when it comes to, you know, global actors in today's world, um, a country like Russia is the weather, but a country like China is the climate. And I think, you know, the, 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 the contestation with the potential to, you know, lapse into conflict between uh, the US and China is probably the most consequential um, factor shaping today's geopolitics. And I find it very interesting, and I'm sure you know some of you will have been to the United States uh, talking to people in the you know, security uh, sort of sector writ large. There is an almost fatalistic assumption that at some point soon the US and China are going to go to war. You know, it is that serious. Um, so, you know, the, the, this shapes everything and it has consequences for other um, disruptive actors who we are now seeing. The obvious one being Russia, 
Um, we've seen this bromance between uh, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping developing over the years when Xi Jinping went last year to see Putin, I think, for his birthday. No one else would go and you know, uh, um, celebrate Putin's birthday, but Xi Jinping will. Um, you know, two Billy no-mates getting together. Um, um, you know, Xi's parting words to Putin were, you know, uh, um, we are seeing um, uh, changes that have uh, not happened uh, for the last hundred years, and we are the ones who are making them. And for... You know, just as China um, chafes under the US-led system and aspires to change it, so too does Vladimir Putin. And there can be no doubt in my mind that Putin's activities have very much been um, enabled and encouraged by the relationship that has developed uh, with China, with Xi Jinping, even if, as is clearly the case, it leaves Russia as the junior partner in in the relationship, and a lot of people in Russia aren't happy about that. But uh, you know that's kind of the way it is. And you know, I remember when 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 the Ukraine invasion kicked off, uh, Joseph Borrell uh, jumped to his feet and said, "You know, China must intervene with Russia to you know to 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 stop this," which I think was a very silly thing for Borrell to say. You know, he of all people should have known better. That there was no way China was going to do this. Um, you know, China, you know, has you know made its choices, and it's quite clear that it will stick by Russia, you know, pretty much through thick and thin. Although, China, in, in in China's defense, it has clearly intervened with Putin to say no nukes. You know, that much I think we can be reasonably confident of. But anything else, really. Um, and I mean, nobody will ever know whether Xi Jinping knew that uh, Putin was about to launch this invasion of Ukraine. Um, you know, the jury really is out. I suspect if, if Xi Jinping was told, he was given, so to speak, the Prozac version. It'll be a quick coup de main, three days tops, and you know, you won't notice, you you won't see the join. That's probably what he was told. And clearly, China's disconcerted about the way things have, have played out, but they're not going to change their position. Similarly, other malign actors are being emboldened, Iran, North Korea. We've seen in, in recent months, um, the gentleman who is referred to in Chinese social media as Kim Fatty Three, uh, Jin San Pang, otherwise uh, uh, Kim Jong-un, um, uh, declare kind of ex-cathedra that North Korea is no longer pursuing reunification of the Korean peninsula. It has designated South Korea as the main enemy. It is doubling down on uh, nuclear testing. It's done six nuclear tests so far. It has developed um, a suite of short, medium, and long-range uh, missiles that are nuclear capable. It has provided a lot of munitions and other military support to Russia in the Ukraine conflict, and in return has been getting from Russia um, supplies of advanced uh, military materiel and uh, assistance with its nuclear and satellite launch programs. China is not very happy about this um, because you know China doesn't want anything to to rock the boat on the Korean Peninsula, but. You know, this has happened, and we now have you know a nuclear armed North Korea that might be tempted to engage in the kind of military provocations that we've come to know and love over the years, secure in the conviction that now they are immune from retaliation because they've got the nukes. And that I think also creates a, you know a very, very dangerous uh, situation. Um Meanwhile, we're seeing a very interesting development, the kind of rise of middle powers um, seeking to you know, navigate um, these you know, shoals of great power competition, but also pursuing to varying degrees some level of strategic autonomy. If we look at Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, they have said in terms, uh, this is what they're going to do. They're going to pursue their own strategic um, road. They, you know, they, they, they've got very considerable resources to bring to bear. Saudi Arabia has got a $1 trillion fund, which is you know, uh, all about in enhancing their capabilities. The worry at the moment, I think, with these states is that they have uh, aspirations and means, but very few of the underpinning institutions 
that would actually make it uh, feasible for them to engage um, effectively uh, in these areas. But you know, if one looks at, for example, the situation we see now in Israel uh, and Gaza, um, ironically, you know, I mean, I, I remember in the 1970s, the then Israeli foreign minister, Abba Eban, observed that the Arabs never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Well, now I think, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, thinking much the same thing. You know, there is here potentially the makings of a solution here, which Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states would be very keen to support um, you know, in return for recognition of Israel. And there are indications that even Iran might be persuaded to go along with this if the conditions were right. But it's clearly not going to happen. You know, the, the, you, know, um, um, you know, Netanyahu is in thrall to a group of right-wing lunatics who are keeping him in power and out of jail. And uh, as long as that uh, remains the case, uh, you know, we're not going to see any movement. Uh, and of course, everything that happened in Gaza simply reinforces the difficulties of coming to any kind of acceptable um, compromise if one is there. Um, so, you know... Um, yeah, this comes at a time when the United States, you know, now uh, no longer dependent upon uh, Middle Eastern oil supplies, effectively energy, not just energy self-sufficient, but, you know, now an exporter of uh, energy. Uh, and of course, it, those exports that, you know, helped Europe get out from under, you know, um, Vladimir Putin's, uh, you know, energy blackmail attempt. Um, wants to get out of the Middle East um, so that it can concentrate its firepower on its major priority, which is um, China. Um, and the $64,000 question in all of this, and I'll end with that because I've probably spoken for long enough, is the US presidential election. You know, in a sense, I think in many ways, and this is particularly true of US-China competition, we're in a kind of phony war period where everybody is waiting to see what's going to happen at the end of 2024. And of course, you know, the $64,000 question is what a Trump 2.0 administration might look like. Um, on the one hand, we see evidence of um, significant uh, move by Trump Republicans towards greater isolationism. Um, on the other hand, the names that are being now bandied about as possible China team for a Trump 2.0 administration uh, seem to consist entirely of China hawks, people like Elbridge Colby, who take the view that the United States must henceforth focus all its firepower on the main threat, which is China, at the expense of all other US commitments. And that, of course, includes NATO, which um, Donald Trump has repeatedly said he wants you know, to, to, to withdraw from. Mercifully, it turns out that under the US Constitution, he's got to get the Senate on side in order to do that. I mean, the US Senate has an almost perfect record of not ratifying uh, international treaties concluded by the US government, but they did actually ratify NATO. So, you know, they're kind of on the hook here. Um, but we really just don't know what's happening. In, in, in Beijing, there's a guessing game in uh, you know, diplomatic salons about which uh, option China would prefer, you know, another Democrat ad, uh, administration or Trump 2.0. And we really don't know. I've looked into this and you know, there are arguments both ways. I don't think the Chinese themselves are, are quite clear what the um, right answer uh, is, is going to be. But we have, you know, this kind of looming uncertainty, which, which leaves us, you know, um, in a you know, um, very unclear situation. We can expect malign actors like Vladimir Putin to seek to take maximum advantage of any uncertainty um, you know, um, that, 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 that may arise. Um, but so this is, I think, you know, the, the, the situation we're in. We've transitioned from a world of relatively low entropy to a world of you know, very high entropy in which it's becoming increasingly clear that many of the institutions that we've come to rely on really aren't fit for purpose uh, for the situation that we're dealing with, but hard to see how we 
come up with any new ones that we would actually like. I, you know, I sort of half seriously coin this concept of Inkster's first law of contemporary Sinology, which states that uh, the Chinese Communist Party normally has half a point, and when they do, it's always the first half. So yes, you know, current international institutions are not for, fit for purpose. No, China's you know uh, so, uh, recommended solutions are you know straight out of the frying pan and into the fire. And, and we wouldn't really want to go there. Um, so we have this uncertainty, and I think we're going to be you know, learning to manage it for some while to come. Um, it's perhaps not a very happy situation, but as I said, you know, it, it, it brings us back to something more like you know, what, what has been normal, um, over you know most of the course of human history, so we'd better get used to it. It's coming whether we like it or not. And I always say in relation to China, um, the reality is that China isn't going to go away. It will change us, whether we like it or not. And the question is how far we allow it to change us, and um, you know uh, how we adapt to the reality of its continued existence. I'll end there. Thank you.